and welcome to a Likely Story Bookstore and Carroll County Public Libraries To Be Read series. I am Debbie Scheller from a Likely Story Bookstore. Just a reminder, some of our upcoming virtual events. Tomorrow, the kids are taking over. Join us for a day of fun for kids of all ages starting at 9 a.m. with story time with author Tracy Hetch. There will also be two writing workshops throughout the day at 2 and 4 p.m. I hope you can join us. Next Tuesday, August 18th at 7 p.m., we will be having Laura Littman as our guest for our To Be Read series. She will be discussing her new book of essays, My Life as a Villainist. Remember, mm -hmm. all books, including tonight's highlight, Exile Music, are available at the library for curbside pickup, or you can get them through a Likely Story bookstore. Come in, call, or order online at www.sykesvillebooks.com. So tonight we welcome Jennifer Style, author of Exile Music. She is actually joining us from London tonight. However, she does live in Uzbekistan with her husband and daughter. Jennifer will be in conversation with Joyce Mueller. Remember, you can enter questions and comments in the chat bar and we will get to, the, get to as many as we can at the end. Jennifer Style is, a, is an award-winning author and journalist. She is the author of The Woman Who Fell From the Sky a memoir of her experience as a journalist in Yemen, and The Amb Ambassador's Wife, a novel about a hostage crisis that, is also, that was also inspired by Stiles own experience. Her new novel, novel, Exile Music, is based on an unexplored slice of World War II history. It's captivating story of a young Jewish girl whose family flees Vienna for safe harbor in the mountains of Bolivia. Joyce Mueller is the current president of the Board of Trustees of Carroll County Public Library. She is Carroll County Public Library's first friend, a voracious reader, and a lifelong Carroll County resident. Thank you both for being here tonight. Jennifer, can you start us off and let us know a little bit about your book? Um, sure, sure. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. I, I know you all have a lot of screen time going on in your lives right now, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, thank you. So um, I'm just gonna briefly tell you a bit about the book. So Exile Music is the story of this, this Viennese family of musicians who flee the Nazis in 1939. And at that time, there were only three countries still offering visas to Jews fleeing the Nazis. Um, and those countries were the Dominican Republic, um, Japan occupied Shanghai, and Bolivia. So I, my characters get a visa to Bolivia and they end up in the middle of the Andes, um, living in a country they know nothing about, they don't understand the culture or the languages, and they have to rebuild their life from start, um, having left, of course, all their family behind, um, everyone they know and love, their professions, um, and everything they owned as well. Um, so that's a little bit about the book. Um, and I thought it worth mentioning before we start off that I got this idea for, the, for this story um, because I've lived in Bolivia for four years. In, in 2012, I moved to La Paz with my husband and my then two-year-old daughter. And my husband was working for the EU as the head of delegation in Bolivia. And he came home from a meeting one night, um, very animated and said, did you know that during World War II, there were about 20,000 Jewish refugees living here in Bolivia? And I hadn't actually known that. I had read a lot about Jewish refugees in other parts of South America, but I didn't know anything specifically about the part of the diaspora in La Paz and other parts of Bolivia. And it wasn't long after that that I actually met one of the survivors of this time who still lives in Bolivia, um, as well as the son of a survivor who is the one that introduced me to the, uh, the other survivor. Um, so through hearing their stories about their family stories, how they ended up in Bolivia, how they adapted, um, why they're still in Bolivia now, um, these got my mind working on what it must have been like to suddenly be in a place so different from where I'd lived all my life um, and how you might start building your life again. 
um, in different soil. So, so that's, that's the, the origin story of the book. I mean, there's other origin stories as well, but that's, that's the main one. Um, and uh, Joyce had asked if I would read just a little bit from the start of the book. So um, the book is organized in the shape of Mahler's Third Symphony. So it's in six movements, um, just like the symphony. There aren't very many symphonies with six movements, so I had to find one. Uh, that was particularly long. Um, anyway, this is from the overture. When I think of Austria, I remember what a child remembers. Details as vivid as the bright shards of a dream. The coffee warmed air of the kitchen. The rough fabric of my father's suits against my cheek. The chalk dust of my classroom tickling my nose the ice-crested snow in the Jesus and Bezo meadow that cut my eyebrow open when I fell off the toboggan halfway down the slope. My Annalisa. My parents' voices in the kitchen as I hovered still and silent by the door, secretly listening. It was important then to listen. I remember the tang of my mother's apricot jam spread over a thick layer of butter on crusty bread the fungal stink of my older brother's dirty sports clothing on the bathroom floor, the earthy scent of the square olive oil soap that was always slipping into the sink. I remember a plum tree in our small communal courtyard that dropped its sour sweet fruit onto our terrace. They were a dark dusty purple, more oval than the green ones we would eat in Bolivia. In Vienna, Annalisa's mother collected the dropped fruits and used them to make torts. I remember my mother's voice in our parlor, starting off low and gathering the energy to soar. I remember the scent of rosin on horsehair, the vibrations of my father's viola, how I could feel the notes on my skin, even after he stopped playing and I was in bed, listening only to the silence. I remember, I remember the inky smell of my school books as I cracked their spines. The sound of Frau Fessler's ruler smashing into my desk when she caught me with a book on my lap during math class. The way the fruit gummies from vices got stuck in my back teeth so I had to pick them out with my fingernails. I remember the damp heat of Annalisa's hand as she folded it with mine for the last time. I remember our neighbor's long coats decorated with flocks of badges saying only, ya. Yeah. The swastikas on every armband and flag pinned to every lapel painted on our sidewalks. They even fell from the sky, flurries of paper spiders dropping onto our heads. I remember the newspapers my parents hid from me under sofa cushions. I remember lying awake twisting the satiny border of my blanket in my fingers until my mother came and curled around me. I remember her breath on my neck, the ice of her fingers on my spine, stroking my skin until I drifted into dreams. The bland quotidian details, the textures of ordinary days, seared themselves most permanently, except for Annalisa. Annalisa, who was neither bland nor ordinary, Annalisa, who was more a part of me than not. Our mothers had birthed us in the same building a week apart, and from then on, there were no divisions between us. The four syllables of her name were my first song. Thank you very much. <laughs> I um, particularly thought it was one of the most beautiful written passages I've read all year. Oh. And it contains every important theme that follows in the book. So when I finished, I went right back to that overture and read it all over again. Um, it caught my heart. It opened my heart to this story. And it certainly, I think, captures all readers. So if you haven't started reading this book, you must get it and read it for yourself. So I... Being, having written a lot in my own life, how many drafts of this opening did you write and what inspired you to use memory, memory, particularly the sounds, which introduces the music of this story? Right. Um, 
Well, um, okay, so there were, um, the, the book starts out with the first line of the book was actually the first thing that this 80 year old survivor said to me. Um, he said, I said, what do you remember about Austria? And he said, when I think of Austria, I remember what a child remembers. And then he went on, only what a child remembers. I remembered my uncle's car, I remembered this, I remembered, and that's how we started our whole conversation when I was interviewing him about his life. This man's name was Guillermo Wiener, and he moved from Vienna to La Paz when he was eight years old. Um, he learned Spanish from his landlord, like my character Orly does. Um, and so he inspired a lot of this. So that's why I started the way I did. However, I went through a million drafts, like a million trillion drafts of this. And this, this particular opening, actually this was the original opening because of that line I had from Guillermo. And then at some point doing a lot of rewrites with my agent, we, we switched, we moved part of the end towards the beginning to make it more dramatic. And then after we sold the book, my editor was like, no, no, it doesn't work this way. You have to go back to that, the, the Austria bit, the I remember bit. Um, but it was really important to me um, when writing this book to pay close attention to sound in particular because it's a musical book, because it's I, music is a through line. It is, the, it is the bridge between their old life in Austria and my character's new life in La Paz. Music is what connects them and also enables them to navigate their new surroundings. Um, I can talk more about that later if you if you like. Um, but um, so Wait, did you know music well yourself? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I wish I did. I think you know I've always wanted to be a musician or a composer, and more than almost anything, I wish I could create music. I'm so envious of musicians. I am um, too. I think many yeah. people are. Right, and so I mean, I needed a lot of. I had to do a ton of research and and have a lot of people who actually know something about music read this book in as many drafts. So I had um, a Mexican composer who lives in Germany, who I met through the PhD program I'm in at the moment. She read a draft and she corrected all sorts of ridiculous mistakes I made. Like I had the mother who's an opera singer, I had her singing all these different soprano roles. And she's like, look, there is more than one kind of soprano. If she's singing this role, she would not also then sing this other role. And I, I said, oh, oh, okay. I didn't know there were so many kinds of surprise. So, you know, I had to, I mean, I kind of did, but, um, but it was good to be corrected. And then she told me places in the book where there wasn't enough sound or I hadn't brought out the South American composers as much as I'd brought out the Austrian composers. And that was really important to me since the bulk of the book is in Bolivia. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I spent a good amount of time on music of that region. Um, so well, you did it very well. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know Orly, the um, from the child from whom the story is told in first person. She her second memory is her father holding her up to the pudi in the opera house in Vienna, and she feels the wood. Um, vibrate from the music that they're playing, which is a, another wonderful memory. And then the third one, which surprised me, was the whistling. Would you say something about the whistling? Yes, yeah, so that was apparently bad luck. So you do not whistle in a concert hall. And um, there are several different ex explanations people have for this, but um, the one I saw most often was that, you know, if there was a gas leak, it would cause whistling. And so it would, it would if my memory serves, it's been a while since I first researched this. Um, and so it would be a sign of alarm that something was wrong. Um, and it's for those, those details like about the golden wooden ladies who vibrate with sound. Um, so I spent time in Vienna when I was researching this um, and I went to the music foreign and I went to the opera and um, and I saw those golden ladies that she calls them her golden ladies. And, you know, and, you know, I took a tour, I took an official tour and learned about it, took photographs so that when I described it later, I could do it accurately. And, um, you know, they said in the tour, like only wood vibrates with music in this specific way. And then why it was really important to have wood um, in a concert hall. And so I thought that was an interesting detail and then thought, well, that was, yeah. 
you did an excellent job. I mean, all the opera and um, the Huguenots, I was looking, you know, up all that too, it was leading me to learn more. Your storytelling of displaced persons is particularly noteworthy to me. Um, after the Germans take over Austria, Orly's family is forced to move from their, their very own apartment that they own to the Jewish ghetto. And you write, quote, love must be assimilated in increments, unquote. And that really touched me. Um, when loss is sudden, trauma follows. And could you share about the trauma suffered by Orly's mother and how she sings on the ship over, farewell my life? Um, sure. So um, my main character Orly and her parents leave behind, I'm not giving anything away here because this happens fairly early on in the book, but they, when they flee Austria, they have to leave behind her brother who had fled Austria earlier because he was um, of the age he would have been enlisted in the army, but he couldn't be enlisted in the army because he was Jewish and he would have just been sent off to a camp. So he had escaped to Switzerland. And so the mother is traumatized by the loss of her son and by the fact that she's leaving him behind in Europe. Um, I mean, they're all traumatized by this. Um, and th actually the family, this ties into music actually as a adaptation um, device is probably the wrong word, but, um, but the different ways in which the family members use music. So while Orly's dad, Jacob, he uses music to adapt to Bolivia by taking Bolivian students and then learning from them about Bolivian music and about Bolivian instruments and becoming re-excited about his art form. Um, Orly takes up a Bolivian instrument, but her mother, who's been a singer her whole life, stops singing. The, the time that she sings in the ship is the very last time she ever sings. Um, and she sings because it's the only way she can communicate to Europe um, her feelings. Like for her as an opera singer, all strong emotions are sung. So, um, so she sings, but after that, um, she feels that her singing has to come from a part of her that's capable of joy, from the place joy comes from. And she doesn't feel like that place exists in her any longer. Um, and she stops singing and without singing is unmoored, no longer has an, an anchor or a rudder or any way to navigate the world. Um, you know, so she wanders off into another pursuit. Um, <laughs> Which is a spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, that's why, I kind of, that was my but doctor. Fakes. I mean, you also make us very hungry reading this yes. book because between the Viennese um, pastries <laughs> and the um, Bolivian, all the kinds of new food that you introduce from their culture, it's just a wonderful, I'm, I had to stay away from the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> reading this book. So um, as a journalist and a wife of a um, former, well, he's an ambassador and has worked for the EU, as you mentioned, you've lived all over the world. Um, did you identify or see yourself in the character Matilda, who is a neighbor to the Orly, Orly's family in Bolivia and herself a former journalist? Oh, that's an interesting, you know, no one's asked me that. Um, and I actually, I hadn't thought about that before, but it must have <laughs> popped out. <laughs> it popped out. It's my, yeah, but that, I mean, I guess that makes sense in a way. I mean, you know, we're, we're very privileged in that we, we're, we're switching countries by choice. Um, so, you know, we are tra travelers of the world in a much more fortunate set of circumstances and a much more fortunate position. Um, we tend to get evacuated. We've been, this is not our first evacuation, but um, uh, so there's adjustments to be made and it's particularly hard now on my daughter now that she's older, but, um, but I suppose that, um, you know, I was, I know there were a lot of, a lot of the people who ended up in Bolivia for whatever reason were, um, musicians, and many of them were also visual artists or actors, um, theater performers, um, and journalists. And I think, you know, I was kind of, when I came up with my characters, I was looking, okay, what kinds of people were there in Bolivia at that time? Um, so that I can be, I mean, what I wanted to do was create a context that would be recognizable to anyone who had lived there during this time, who had survived this time. 
but my story itself would be fictional. And I got an email this, I think the week after, the two weeks after this book came out from a 90 year old man in Florida who wrote to me and said, this book is so close to my own experience that you cannot have invented it. And I must know who you talk to. <laughs> um, so, and now we're pen pals. Um, and I, yeah, I want to do a podcast with him or something. Oh, that, I was, that's really quite lovely. Did he know yeah. the, um, the gentleman that you spoke to in Bolivia? Had he? He didn't. He did, but oh. No, I mean, I asked them, but he was actually, there were 20,000 of them. So I guess. Well, true. And, 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 a, and a lot of them left most of them left after the war. So between 1946 and the 50s, most people left because La Paz is at 12,000 feet. It's a very hard place to adapt to, um, just in terms of the altitude alone. Um, there would have been not much medical care of any kind. It would have been you know, much harder to live there than elsewhere in South America. Um, and a lot of people also moved to the US once that was possible or to the newly created Israel. Um, so they, they, they moved to various places, but it, very few of them actually stayed behind. Um, so I was, you know, pleased that Guillermo was still, he's still alive. He's 88 now, I think. So uh, he, was he the person I thought I read in one of um, your other interviews that did not want to go back to Austria? No, never. That was him. Never, right. never, never. And he was, I mean, when we talked, you know, I asked him, would he, cause he said Austria had invited him back um, to apologize for having murdered everyone he knew. Um, and he said, never, never will I ever go back to Austria. I can't ever forgive them for what they've done. And he is very, he defines himself as 100% Bolivian. You know, his name was Wilhelm, but he's Guillermo now. Um, he, you know, he, he's just not, he doesn't identify at all as Austrian. You know, he became a cinema owner. He built three cinemas in La Paz. He became head of the organization of cinema owners. Um, and just, he just completely integrated himself into the fabric of this, of, of, La, of Paseño life in a way that most people did not. You know, a lot of the refugees kept themselves out of a sense of safety and fear and language barriers and all kinds of things. Um, but I was interested, you know, when I was creating Orly, I wanted her to be there young enough so that she could learn Spanish in the way that Guillermo had learned Spanish, you know, when you're young and you just absorb it. Um, but I also wanted her um, to become, to have the opportunity at least to become Bolivian and maybe not leave, maybe leave, who knows? I don't want to give that away. Um, no, I think you did that really well and that, Orly, um, she learns by her observation. And you talk a lot about when you're in a new country, you have to be quiet and observe what's going on around you. And that, and, and accepts um, everything that's going on. Even some of the cultural beliefs, which were radically different from what she um, experienced in her own home. Maybe you could say a few words about that. Yeah, definitely. Because I had a conversation about just this with my, with my editor because she was saying that in the early Bolivia chapter, she's like, Orly is suddenly so quiet. Like, and I said to her, um, well, my own experience when I switch countries a lot, which I do, is that when I get to a place, it is just watching like, okay, how do I order something in a restaurant? How do I pay for something in the grocery store? How do I, you, I mean, when you move to a foreign country, every, all of us become children again. And we're like, you know, I need something to wash my teeth. You know, we're, we go back to that age when we're learning how to speak all over again. And when we first moved to Uzbekistan, I hadn't had time to start Russian yet. And I went to the grocery store to buy I don't know, shampoo or something. And I couldn't figure out what was shampoo. There's no language I recognize on anything. And I was just in the store going, okay, I'm gonna buy like grapes cause I know they're grapes and I know, you know, but anything that had a label or um, anything. Different I, yeah, I really struggled to, um, to understand. So. And, and I think that's another reason why Orly works so well as your protagonist to tell this story. Um, and as an adult, I'm sorry, do you, as an adult, people sometimes don't wanna 
look like they're, they appear stupid, Americans especially. <laughs> right, right, that's true. I mean, but you have to be willing to look stupid um, if you're gonna learn anything. I mean, we, that's where we all kind of have to start from a place of admitting we don't know anything. And if you don't admit you don't know anything, then how can you, you learn? Um, so, I yeah. love too that you had orally formed these friendships with um, with really the native families of Bolivia, like <laughs> that are not given the same. Uh, they're not even given citizenship rights. They have very, you know, their human rights are tampered upon, and that she became very close both to the. Um, Arara, is that correct? Amara? I, the Amara, yeah. Amara, thank you. Amara and Chechka. Yeah, Ketra. <laughs> I'm not good with languages, but no, <laughs> it was so interesting to me to, I, having studied, um, I took a course in the political development of South America. I didn't get to Bolivia, but it was very interesting to see all over the world, these people are treated wrong and just as the um, Aborigines in Australia. So, you know, yeah. it's the Jewish people that went there had a lot in common with some of the people that were the native first generations of that nation. Well, it, yeah, it seemed to me that if I had just been escaped a situation where I was being persecuted and I found myself seeing other people being persecuted on the streets in similar ways, that I might be, that I might have a certain understanding of that and um, feel a certain kinship with those people, um, which is how Orly feels when she sees the way the indigenous Bolivians are treated. You know, they couldn't even own their own land until 1952. Um, and, you know, these are all relics of colonialism. Um, which did a great job of wrecking South America. That's one of my questions. How do you see European colonialism in the world affecting Native peoples? Yeah, well, badly, badly. badly. Um, yeah, I mean, colonialism is a horrific, horrific thing um, and destroyed all you know, cultures and people and languages, you know, um, Spanish is, you know, I remember, you know, people, there's certain people who would mock the way that Eva Morales, who's Imra, you know, who's president and who's Imra, they'd mock the way he spoke Spanish. His native language isn't Spanish. Um, so, you know, which is ridiculous. Why should we expect him to speak a European, was essentially a European language? Um, these people all had their own languages before the other way that you have orally makes sense of her life, um, besides observing and sort of putting herself in the different cultural situations was through her writing. Um, she and Annalisa, her life longest friend in life, they had a, a bunny story. They have created as children this fairy tale world and it sustained orally um, throughout this trauma. But she's doing stories all the time. She's writing letters all the time to Annalisa in hopes that one day they can reconnect. And then she also does poems and she defines poems. And I guess this is your definition, which I thought was again, just lovely as quote, it's often in the space between things we think are irreconcilably different that the most interesting connections are made. And that space is where poems live. Ah, oh, that gives me chills to um, <laughs> read that out loud. So, you know, again, um, say something about Orly's writing and why you introduced that in this um, story. I guess it came out of her love for storytelling and telling stories. And that came from, this is another book origin piece, um, is that when I was in Bolivia one morning when my daughter was, I think three or four, probably three, she came into the kitchen and she, you know, she couldn't remember having lived anywhere before Bolivia. So she said, where did I live before Bolivia? And I said, well, you lived in London. And she said, well, before London. And I said, Jordan. And she said, before Jordan. And I said, Yemen and before, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, not that much longer because she was only three or four. <laughs> but um, so then she said, well, where did I live before I was in your tummy? And I said, well, 
you didn't exist. And she looked at me like in shock and horror and said, of course I existed. I've always existed. It was like inconceivable to her that there was a time in which she did not exist. And so she said, well, I, I lived in a place called Bunny Belts. And she, this was a country with a queen and then a president who was a hermaphrodite because she wanted someone who had both male and female characteristics. She thought that was important for representation of the population, of both halves of the population. And so um, she spent years, like at least five years, where she built on this land she created but of bunny belts. And the, so I was starting to write the book around that time. And I thought if I were a little girl and felt my world getting smaller every single day and felt the Nazis growing closer and closing in on me and my family, I might need to escape to an imaginary world because I don't have the ability to psychologically cope with reality and what's happening. Um, it would be too terrifying. And so that's why she creates this world with Annalisa. It's their way of escaping, but it's also the way of escaping the conflicts that eventually come up between their families. Um, you know, it's, it, they kind of escape from any kind of reality into that story. And, and so I think that's where it started is her love of narrative. And then the poems, I thought in a way, you have two things that seem completely different, say Vienna and La Paz. And you know, here she is on her first day of school trying to make sense of her life and her identity and who she is in this classroom in La Paz. And her teacher gives her this assignment and says, think of two things that are as different as possible and then write the connection. Like that's the exercise the teacher gives them. Um, but it applies to so many parts of her life. You know, In other words, music is the space between Vienna and La Paz, but so are the stories of Frieden Glukasenland, which is what I came up with instead of bunny belts. So, <laughs> um, but there's still bunnies. Um, so, so I guess, I mean, I guess a, a lot of this was just keeping myself in the mindset of how would I make sense of myself in the world in more than one place. If I was being replanted in foreign soil and trying to figure out how to get nourishment from it, what would I do? Well, you know, you have lived in many places and um, what, what for you defines home? Ah, uh, this, is, this is a very tough question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I mean, the short answer to that is that um, my husband and my daughter are my home. They are the only thing that's consistent in my life. Um, and because we keep moving countries, even though we have very dear friends in every country we've landed in, um, we are usually not in the same country with most of the people we love. Um, and that makes us kind of lean towards each other even more than perhaps we would if we were in one place all of our lives. So we really rely on each other um, for staying upright almost, um, for any sort of sense of stability. Um, it's just that. I mean, it's like there's certain little things that I appreciate, like no matter where we are, no matter how soulless a hotel room we're in, like my husband always lines his little toothbrush, his toothpaste in this specific constellation He's very, very tidy um, in a way that I'm completely not. Um, but he arranges his things in these perfect little constellations, no matter where we are. And it's almost like that's a little piece of home. It's my husband's little constellation of his toothbrush and his you know, contact lenses case and you know, those things. Um, and then for my daughter, she, she does take you know, her animals. So I think that's why bunnies were so important to her because her stuffed animals were the only thing that was consistent other than her parents. And so we find, and for me, again, of course, writing is, is, a, is a home to me as well, because that's how I make sense of my new environment. And I usually write every morning before anyone else is awake, um, but also before other thoughts interrupt my day or before I get upset about social media. Um, you know, I just need to, to write down, <laughs> you know, what's going on. And it's, it's, I actually don't even think I understand how I feel about things or what I'm thinking about or what's really on my mind until I write it down. It's, it's just kind of my process of living in the world and that process goes with me. Um, 
I mean, the three of us, we've we're completely pretty much detached from like furniture has become meaningless to us really. Um, you know, it matters whether the stove works well or not, you know, things like that, but everything else, we're not that picky. So in a way it's made us very <laughs> adaptable. So while nowhere is truly home like that, some places are everywhere is home in a way, if that makes sense. Well, I think it's, I bring it up too, because now that we're in this worldwide pandemic, in some ways, the physicality of a home has taken on a greater importance. Would you not agree? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we were- And, you know, we and each other, you know, the immediate family, excuse me. No, that's absolutely correct. And when we were evacuated from Uzbekistan in March, just my daughter and I, my husband's still there. Um, we had two days to find an apartment in London. And we said to them, like the only, we do have a permanent home, which is in France, which we hope to someday live in. <laughs> we see it, but that's where we plan to live when he retires. And, you know, I can just sit around and write books in France um, and teach and whatnot. Um, but I, so we, we asked, you know, the foreign office if we could just go stay in our own home and they said no no you have to be in London it's very important that you're in London um, otherwise we can't help you properly um, so we had to come to London but we didn't have anywhere to live um, and right in the middle of a pandemic is not a great time not to have anywhere to land so and it, we were lucky really really lucky in that I happened to be having an email conversation with a writer friend of mine um, whose book I happened to be reading. And so, and I mentioned, we're being evacuated in two days and we don't have anywhere to land. He said, well, let me put some feelers out. And that same day, got an email saying, hey, you can come land here, we'll take you in. And we have the most brilliant landlady and, fam and her family in the world. Like they just said, come live with us. They didn't ask for any references. They didn't ask for a deposit. Um, they were just like, you and your daughter are homeless in a pandemic, come live with us. And so we were like, I was like in tears of gratitude. I was like, Thank you so much. So you know, we've been really lucky to have been in this place. But um, my daughter's, you know, she's been very lonely, and we've been quite isolated here. So we are going to go to our village in France in the hope that she can at least see some other children mm -hmm. um, and sort out her schooling somehow. There's other problems we all have, right? Yeah, now. I'm sure. I'm alone. Yeah, it's so true. I, I, so this is your third, I know you're working on another book. I will talk about that in a second, but would you say something about when you write these books and particularly this one, what's your major, what are the one or two major takeaways for you as, as you experience this story? Um, I think for me, I think of, a lot of what I'm interested in exploring as a writer is that, is that space in between things or kind of that, that area between binaries. So um, when, when your old home is no longer your home but your new home's not yet your home, where do you live? Um, or if you're maybe neither completely straight and neither completely gay, where's your sexuality? Um, if you're an immigrant, where is your home? And everyone defines that differently. Um, and I'm interested in that space. I like gray space. I like, I like that space that is not at one end of the spectrum or another. That, that is where interesting things happen and where the interesting stories are for me. Um, and so that's the kind of liberal space, I, I, that kind of between borders kind of space where you aren't quite sure who you are, where you are, and you have to recreate that. That interests me. Um, so kind of that sense of it as an immigrant, um, the epigraph of my book. Um, mm -hmm. can, I, can I just read that yes, up? And that's people know what I'm talking about. So just this one quote by um, Edwidge Danticat, recreating your entire life is a form of reinvention on par with the greatest works of literature. Um, and I love that because recreating your life is a creative act. Um, you've made yourself as one person, you're a viola player for the Vienna Philharmonic, and then suddenly you have to make yourself all over again because no one in Bolivia knows or cares that you were a viola player in the Vienna Philharmonic. Um, you just have to do something different um, and figure out, well, who am I if I'm not a viola player in the Vienna Philharmonic? Who am I then? Um, and it's weird, so in each country, 
you know, I have to say, oh, who am I in Uzbekistan? And what was I like in Bolivia? And what was I like in Yemen? And I was different aspects of myself in each of these places. And then when I return ho home to, I guess I still think of it as home to New York City, you know, I walk down the street and think all the aspects are coming together. It's, um, <laughs> well, isn't it true that we um, grow as individuals if we're reinventing ourselves or forcing ourselves in the gray spaces of life? Yes, yes, I hope I'm never done. I hope I'm never done. Then you would just close the case, I guess, I don't know. I had one other thing and then I guess we'll soon turn it over to some other questions, but um, well, you did, um, here's what I wanted to talk about. What I will remember from this book and now that I'm also reading the um, woman who fell from the sky, wonderful story, is um, that, these countries that so many know so little about, you truly bring them alive. They, to me, were characters and characters that I now, I want to travel there. I know there's not the easiest places to get to, but you make the people and how accepting they are come alive. And I was with you in the Andes and I was in Orly's room and she looks out and sees the peak of um, Mount Iliamna. Ilimani. Ilimani, okay. Yeah. I, I just, you made me want to know more about these countries. And um, at one time I had met one of the former ambassadors of Yemen some years back. And he, all he talked about was the people. I, I know that from my own travels, but Bolivia, um, Yemen, I hope one day more Americans can go there. I hope so. I mean, it's true. Yemen, I mean, the Yemenis are the world's most hospitable, friendliest people I've ever met in my entire life. Um, I mean, you walk down the street in Yemen and literally every person who passes you says, we love you. Welcome to Yemen. We love you. And they mean it. You know, there, that was how everyone greeted me for four years. You know, I was welcome to Yemen for four years, relentlessly, and it was wonderful. Um, and so, I mean, that's part of why I wrote that, The Woman Who Fell From the Sky, is I wanted people back in the U.S. to meet my Yemenis, because the only time that the media ever mentions Yemenis is they're like, oh, Yemen, the ancestral homeland of Osama bin Laden and, you know, a nest of terrorists, which is not the truth. Um, and actually, you know, Yemen kind of needs our help right now more than ever because they're having a massive humanitarian crisis, massive, massive humanitarian crisis. And I read Bolivia was um, written up in NPR did a story yesterday about their problems with the government and the elections and how it's holding back treatment of the um, of the COVID-19. So yeah. maybe I'll end my part of the conversation uh, before we open it up to others. If you would show us the sign language between Orly and her lifelong friend, Annalisa, signifying, I come in peace. Okay, um, I think I remember this. Okay, so you're gonna get it all on the screen. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, yeah it's something like, wait, hang on, I'm gonna scoot down on my chair, like, <laughs> put it over your head. Yeah, sorry, like I just love that. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, make that in an international symbol that we do each other that way. Yeah, yeah. If it doesn't mean something else in actual sign language of some yeah. kind, so yeah. Well, that is sad, but I, uh, peace is really what we need to um, have in our hearts for others in these situations. Um, Debbie? I'm here. Thank you, Joyce. That was a great conversation. Um, thank, you. thank you, Jennifer. Um, we got actually a lot of the questions that have come through have been answered. So um, you did a great job, Joyce. Oh, I think it's more. <laughs> um, uh, we have some comments and some questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, just to let you know, Jennifer, there's a lot of um, praise out there for um, Exxon Music and some people wanting to read it. Um, Nancy Starr, so happy to get a chance to listen to Jennifer and what a great idea for a structure. Um, Deborah is saying, hi, Jennifer, we love the book. I hope you know some of these people. <laughs> yes, I do, thank you. Janice, can't wait to read the book. Um, and Nancy is saying, your daughter is lucky to have you as a guide, even if evacuation specialists shouldn't be a thing. 
And <laughs> Susan, um, she thought of your daughter as she read about Orly's bunnies. Um, yeah. A couple questions for you. Um, they're asked, uh, it has been asked that La Paz and Vienna are extreme contrasts in cities. How did you choose these very opposite types of cities for your novel? Right. Well, I mean, I feel like they found me because, you know, first I found the survivors and they happened to come from Vienna or one of them came from Vienna. And then my other good friend came from, his parents came from a part of Poland that is now part of the USSR, I mean, sorry, was then part of the USSR, is now part of the Ukraine. Sorry, it's hard to remember the exact <laughs> order. Um, anyway, and the, he was born in La Paz, but his parents came from there. And his parents' first child, who was a girl, was murdered by the Nazis and et cetera. So, so I met him and he's the one who introduced me to Guillermo. And Guillermo had come from Vienna. And I guess because it was the Austrian consul who talked to my husband first about it, he was probably framing it in terms of there being a lot of Austrian Jewish refugees in particular. And there were, there were a lot of Austrians and Germans in particular, but there were also a lot of Polish and Czech and other Eastern European countries. Um, and La Paz, you know, was where they, was where they came. It was one of those three countries that, that offered visas to Jewish refugees. Um, and I also happened because I'd lived in La Paz for four years. I had a lot of time to research the city and get to know it. Um, I hadn't been back to Austria since I was my daughter's age, since I was 10. So I went back to Vienna and researched that because it was really important to me that I see the door where of Orly's apartment building. So that I've, I've took a picture of her door. I know what it looks like. I walked the routes she would have walked. I went to the canal she would have gone to. Um, and then I went to Genoa. Sorry, I'm getting off the topic, but um, I went to Genoa because it was really important to me that I see Orly's last view of Europe, like as they're leaving it forever. I wanted her, I wanted to know what she saw um, as they were pulling away. And so it probably ended up being only a sentence in the book, but still worth the trip. That's right. um, <laughs> it's yeah, I mean, you know, it was a real hardship going to Italy and eating all that pasta. But oh, yeah. <laughs> you've got to make sacrifices for your art. So. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, it has been asked why you decided to do the story from Orly's view rather than one of the parents. And would you consider doing a follow-up with the parents' view? That's very interesting. Um, so I chose to do it from Orly's point of view. Um, because she was young enough so that she could properly um, integrate herself somewhat into Bolivia and um, perhaps end up feeling Bolivian that she could learn. I wanted her to be able to learn Spanish easily. Um, and I wanted, you know, in, in a way she becomes a guide for her parents, kind of like many immigrants' children mm -hmm. um, end up helping their parents who don't speak English in the US, for example. You know, they will be their guide to their parents who don't speak English. Like in Bolivia, um, you know, she ends up being a bit of a guide for her parents who don't speak Spanish or any of the indigenous languages, of course. But um, so, so I wanted someone in the family who could learn Spanish easily and then serve as a guide to the rest of them. And I wanted her to be young enough so she could really take in everything as new and perhaps wonderful and not someone who wasn't spending all their time thinking about the Nazis in Vienna and what they must be doing. Um, because children live more in the present time than we do. They don't think ahead or behind. And the parents would be always worrying about their son or... I just thought it was more interesting to have Orly's perspective and discover mm -hmm. it through, through her eyes. And she does grow up. She's like in her mid forties or something when the book ends. So um, you kind of get an adult perspective as well. I don't know if I'd want to write the book from either her parents' perspective. I mean, writing it from her mom's perspective might just do me in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Very depressing, right? <laughs> yeah. I'd have to go to dark places that I don't know. Um, did you have any surprises that came about during your research for the book? Yes, I did. I had a lot of surprises. Um, I read a lot of Imra mythology. That's something else I did while I was doing research is I was looking up the myths that the Imra, her Imra friend would have been familiar with from the lake. Um, and then finding 
interesting similarities and themes between fairy tales and Imra mythology and, and just Again, taking two different things and it's a common theme. And, yeah. And some kind of bridge. Um, oh, I know, this is a horrible thing, but very early on, kind of right from the beginning, when I started doing research on the Vienna Philharmonic, um, you know, the horrific thing that I discovered was that the Vienna Philharmonic sent all of its Jewish musicians, all 13 of them, um, evicted them from the orchestra and sent most of them to their deaths. Oh, so wow. they, they either died or they died of a result of having lost their job, their home, et cetera. Um, a few survived in exile, but most of them died. Um, so, and while they did this to their Jewish musicians, none of whom ever returned to the orchestra, they continued to employ Nazis until 1967. Wow. So that to me was surprising. Yeah. In 1967, like not only did they employed them through the war and after the war, but until 1967. And I thought, I want to make sure that people are reminded of this. This is horrific. Absolutely. You know, this, this organization has the bloodiest past and what they did to the, their Jewish musicians. And I felt like that was really important to, I also, you know, I included the names of those real life musicians because I wanted their names all written down again. You know, it's so hard to get information on them. Um, we don't even know where some of their bodies are. And I just thought, I want their name and something else. They have to be here. So. That's anyway. a great honor for them as well, I'm sure. Well, um, I don't know. About, yeah. <laughs> um, so a couple questions on your writing style. Um, are you a planner or are you a pantser? <laughs> oh, I am so not a planner. <laughs> so not a planner. Um, and frankly, I never wore pants even before COVID. I'm much more of a <laughs> And so, um, yeah, so I have a very inefficient writing process, hugely inefficient. So I'll usually start with a scene and I will write in scenes that I then cobble together, um, almost like I'm stitching a quilt together in a way. Um, I'll move them around in time, but I'll think in terms of like, what needs to happen next? And what's the best way for me to show that bit of character development or that experience or you know how do I make that happen in a scene in which there's clear change and in which you know um but it's messy I mean the ambassador's wife because it goes back and forth in time was particularly you know it was all like you know 52 cards in a deck and I shuffled them around until we finally got the right shuffling um but it took a very long time um and with doing that um do you have find it harder to do revisions or do you find it harder setting up and doing your drafting and original um, um, writing? Well, I think, I guess I think the first draft is hardest, but I love the rewriting and I do tons of rewriting. I incessantly rewrite. So, because for me, the first draft is just generating clay and every successive draft is shaping that clay into something approaching a work of art, right? So you've got your clay, your first draft, and then you're like, wow, now that I know where it ends, I can go back and start over. And um, my PhD supervisor calls it breadcrumbing, where you foreshadow the crumbs, <laughs> little details um, through it. So, um, so I do a, a lot of that and it was funny because, you know, I was saying to someone the other day, every time I hear John Irving talk, I'm convinced I'm doing everything wrong because he says you have to know where it ends, that he always knows the last line of a book before he starts it. Maybe he doesn't say we have to, but that's what he does. Um, and he says, I, how can you write a book if you don't know where it ends? And I think, well, but that's what this next, next draft is for. Like, <laughs> I, I need the first draft to figure out where it ends. And right. then the rest of the drafts are doing the kind of work that John Irving apparently does in the first draft, you know, where he knows where it ends and then he does the breadcrumbing throughout. Do you ever find that, um, or was there any, I'm sorry, is, was there anything that during your editing process that was taken out of the book that you wish hadn't or that you, you know, um, would have liked to have kept in there? Um, with this book, I'm pretty sure that everything that was taken out was the right decision. Um, I'm not just saying that because I love my editor. Um, she's very good. Um, I mean, I did write, like I had written the whole journey over in the boat. So that's all written. Um, but I think actually it was my agent that was like, you don't need that. Just, we want to just get to Bolivia. We don't, so she's right. She was right. You know, we did need to 
we didn't need the boat journey and I right. could refer back to it in other scenes. So I, you know, there's some parts that I overwrite connections between things where I don't need to. Um, and then I need people to point that out to me at some point. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and I know Joyce mentioned that, you know, I don't, I can't remember if you got to it or not. What are you writing now? Did you get to that Joyce? No, I didn't. Okay. No. What are you writing now? Can you give us a little clue? Sure. Um, well, I just finished the second draft, so I'm actually pretty far along on this next one, so I'm pleased. Um, it's, uh, it's another South American story, and it's about a group of, I guess, queer revolutionaries who are artists living underground in Bolivia or a country like Bolivia. I haven't made a final determination on that. Um, but that was also inspired by a, a documentary filmmaker I met in Bolivia who was making a documentary film about um, the gay and lesbian people who had been forced out of their homes, you know, physically or sexually abused by their family, um, punished for their sexuality, for being who they were. Um, and a lot of them were sleeping literally underground in, in these caves. Um, and so that was my starting point for this book and thinking, you know, what if it were only women? And what if, you know, they created their own underworld that wasn't, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of books that explore a very male underworld or an underground that's very violent. There's very, there's guns, you know, these revolutionaries um, that you read about in like the underdogs, that Mexican novel. And there's a, there's a lot of kind of violent uprisings. And I thought, what would it be like if they weren't using weapons? What if they were trying to create some sort of revolution but some sort of artistic revolution. And what if it all went horribly wrong because of interference from a European, um, you know, the post-colonial type of stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting themes in this one. Do you have a title yet? Well, I have a working title, but my titles, my working titles never stay. <laughs> they're always terrible. That sounds really interesting. We look forward to it next year, maybe? I don't know, we'll have to see because you now we'll, I'll, yeah, we'll have to see. I haven't, you know, sold it or even shown it to my agent. So, okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jennifer. We really appreciate you being with us tonight. Um, everybody, um, please get the book at a likely story or at Carroll County Public Library. We have them all in stock and we look forward to you enjoying the book. Jennifer, thank you. We look forward to your next book and um, we'll see you. Joyce, thank you as well. You were wonderful as always. Oh. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us Thank tonight. You. And don't forget to join us for all our events. You can go on either of our websites or Facebook pages for more events. Thank you and good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me.